Narrative of the Captivity and Restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson by Mrs. Mary Rowlandson. The sovereignty and goodness of God, together with the faithfulness of his promises displayed, being a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, commended by her to all that desires to know the Lord's doings to and dealings with her especially to her dear children and relations. The second edition, corrected and amended, written by her own hand for her private use, and now made public at the earnest desire of some friends, and for the benefit of the afflicted. Deuteronomy 32:39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, neither is there any can deliver out of my mind. Deliver out of my hand. On the 10th of February, 1675, came the Indians with great numbers upon Lancaster. Their first coming was about sunrising. Hearing the noise of some guns, we looked out. Several houses were burning and the smoke ascending to heaven. There were five persons taken in one house. The father and the mother and a suckling child they knocked on the head. The other two they took and carried away alive. There were two others who, being out of their garrison upon some occasion, were set upon. One was knocked in the head, the other escaped. Another there, who was running along, was shot and wounded and fell down. He begged them his life, promising them money, as they told me, but they would not hearken to him but knocked him in the head and stripped him naked and split open his bowels. Another, seeing many of the Indians about his barn, ventured and went out, but was quickly shot down. There were three others belonging to the same garrison who were killed. The Indians getting upon the roof of the barn had advantage to shoot down upon them over their fortification. Thus these murderous wrenches went on, burning and destroying before them. At length they came and beset upon our own house, and quickly it was the dolefulest day that ever mine eyes saw. The house stood upon the edge of the hill. Some of the Indians got behind the hills, other into the barn, and others behind anything that could shelter them, from all which places they shot against the house so that the bullets seemed to fly like hail. And quickly they wounded one man among us, then another, then a third. About two hours, according to my observation, in that amazing time, they had been about the house before they prevailed to fire it, which they did with flax and hemp, which they had brought out of the barn, and there being no defense about the house, only two flankers at opposite corners, and one of them not finished. They fired it once, and one ventured out and quenched it, but they quickly fired it again, and that took. Now is the dreadful hour come that I have often heard in time of war as if was the case for others, but now my eye seed it. Some in our house were fighting for their lives, others swallowing in their blood, the house on fire over our heads, and the bloody heathen ready to knock us on the head if we started if we stirred out. Now might we hear mothers and children crying out for themselves and one another, Lord, what shall we do? Then I took my children and one of my sisters, hers, to go forth and leave the house. But as soon as we came to the door and appeared, the Indians shot so thick that the bullets rattled against the house as if one had taken a handful of stones and threw them, so they were fain to give back. We had six stout dogs belonging to our garrison, but none of them would stir, though another time, if any Indian came to the door, they were ready to fly upon him and tear him down. The Lord hereby would make us the more acknowledge his hand and to see that our help, help is always in him. But out we must go, the fire increasing and coming along behind us roaring and the Indians gaping before us with their guns, spears, and hatchets to devour us. No sooner were we out of the house but my brother-in-law being before wounded in defending the house in or near the throat fell down dead, whereat the Indians scornfully shouted and hallowed and were presently upon him, stripping off his clothes, the bullets flying thick. One went through my side, and the same as would seem, through the bowels and hands of my dear child in my arms. One of my elder sister's children, 
named William, had his leg broken, which the Indians perceiving, they knocked him on his head. Thus we were butchered by those merciless heathens, standing amazed with the blood running down to our heels, my eldest sister being yet in the house, and seeing those woeful sights, the infidels hauling mothers one way, and children another, and some wallowing in their blood, and her elder son telling her that her son William was dead, and myself was wounded, she said, And Lord, let me die with them which was no sooner said, but she was struck with a bullet and fell down dead over the threshold. Hope she is reaping the fruit of her good labors, being faithful to the service of God in her place. In her younger years she lay much trouble upon spiritual accounts, till it pleased God to make that precious scripture take hold her heart. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. 2 Corinthians 12.19 More than twenty years later I have heard her tell how sweet and comfortable that place was to her. But to return, the Indians laid hold of us, putting, pulling me one way and the children the other, and said, Come, go along with us. I told them I would, it, they would kill me. They answered, If I were willing to go with them, they would not hurt me. Oh, the doleful sight that now was to behold this house. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. Of thirty-seven persons who were in this one house, none escaped either present death or bitter captivity, save only one, who might say as he, and I only am escaped alone to tell the news. Job 1.15 There were twelve killed, some shot, some stabbed with their spears, some knocked down with hatchets. When we are in prosperity, oh, little we think of such dreadful sights and to see our dear friends and relations lie bleeding out their heart blood upon the ground. There was one who was chopped in the head with a hatchet and stripped naked, and yet was crawling up and down. It is a solemn sight to see so many Christians lying in their blood, some here, some there, like a company of sheep torn by wolves, all of them stripped naked by a company of hellhounds, roaring, singing, ranting, and insulting as if they would have torn our very hearts out, Yet the Lord, by his almighty power, preserved the number of us from death, for there were twenty-four of us taken alive and carried captive. I had often before this said that if Indians should come, I should rather be killed by them than taken alive, but when it came to the trial, my mind changed. Their glittering weapons so daunted my spirit that I chose rather to go along, as I may say, with the ravenous beasts, than, the, than that moment to end my days and that I may the better declare what happened to me during that grievous captivity. I shall particularly speak of the several removes that we had up and down the wilderness. The first remove. Now away we must go with these barbarous creatures, with our bodies wounded and bleeding, and our hearts no less than our bodies. About a mile we went that night, upon a hill within sight of the town where they intended to lodge, there was hard by a vacant house, deserted by the English before for fear of the Indians. I asked them whether I may not lodge in the house that night, to which they answered, What, will you love Englishmen still? And this was the dolefulest night that my eyes ever saw. Oh, the roaring and singing and dancing and yelling of those black creatures in the night which made the place a lively resemblance of hell. And as miserable was the waste, that there was, made of horses, cattle, sheep, swine, calves, lambs, roasting pigs and fowl, which they had plundered in the town, some roasting, some lying and burning, and some boiling to feed our merciless enemies, who were joyful enough gone, my husband, though, though we were disconsolate, to add to the dolefulness of the former day and the dismalness of the present night, my thoughts ran upon my losses and sad bereaved condition all was gone my husband gone all separated from me he being at the bay and to add to my grief the indians told me they would kill him as soon as he came homeward my children gone my relations and friends gone our house and home and all of our comforts within door and without all was gone except my life and i knew not but the next moment that might go too there remained nothing to me but one poor wounded babe, and it seemed at present worse than death, 
that it was in such pitiful condition bespeaking compassion that i had no refreshing for it no suitable things to revive it little do many think what is the savageness and brutalness of this barbarous enemy <sighs> even those that seem to profess more than the others among them when the english have fallen into their hands those seven that were killed at lancaster the summer be before upon a sabbath day and the one that was afterwards killed upon a weekday were slain and mangled in a barbarous manner by one-eyed john the marlborough's praying indians which captain mosley brought to boston as the indians told me the second remove but now the next morning i must return i must oops, but now the next morning i must turn my back upon the town and travel with them into the vast and desolate wilderness i knew not whither it is not my tongue or pen can express the sorrows of my heart the bitterness of my spirit that i had at this departure but god was with me in a wonderful manner carrying me along and bearing up my spirit that i did not quite fail one of the indians carried my poor wounded babe upon a horse it went mooning all along i shall die i shall die i went on foot after it with sorrow that cannot be expressed at length i took off I took it off the horse and carried it in my arms until my strength failed and I fell down with it. Then they set me upon a horse with my wounded child in my lap, and there being no furniture upon the horse's back, as we were going down a steep hill, we both fell over the horse's head, at which they, like inhumane creatures, laughed and rejoiced to see it, though I thought we should have ended our days as overcome with so many difficulties. But the Lord renewed my strength still and carried me along that I might see more of his power, yea, so much more than I could ever thought of, had I not experienced it. After this, it quickly began to snow, and when night came on, they stopped, and now down I must sit in the snow by a little fire and a few boughs behind me with my sick child in my lap, and calling much for water, being now, through the wound, fallen into a violent fever. My own wound also growing so stiff that I could scarce sit down or rise up, yet so it must be that i must sit in this cold winter night upon this cold snowy ground with my sick child in my arms looking at every hour would be the last of its life and having no christian friend near me either to comfort or help me oh, i must see the wonderful power of god that my spirit did not utterly sink under my affliction still the lord upheld me with his graciousness and merciful spirit and we were both alive to see the light of the next morning the third remove the morning being come they prepared to go on their way one of the indians got upon a horse and they set me up behind him with my poor sick babe in my lap a very poor feeble condition we were in there being not the least crumb of refreshing that came from either of our mouths from wednesday night to saturday night except only a little cold water this day in the afternoon about an hour by sun we came to a pla place where they intended via an indian town called winameset northward of kabong when we were come oh the number of pagans now merciless enemies that there came about me that i may say as david i had fainted unless i believed etc psalm twenty seven thirteen the next day was the sabbath I then remembered how careless I had been of God's holy time, how many Sabbaths I had lost and misspent, and how evilly I had walked in God's sight, which lay so close upon, upon my spirit, that it was easy for me to see how righteous it was with God to cut off the thread of my life and cast me out of his presence forever. Yet the Lord still showed me mercy and upheld me, and he wounded me with one hand, so he healed me with the other. This day there came to me one Robert Pepper, a man belonging to Roxbury, who was taken in Captain Beer's fight and had now a considerable time with the Indians, and up with them almost as far as Albany to see King Philip, as he told me, and was now very lately came into these parts. Hearing, I say, that I was in this Indian town, he obtained to leave to come to see me. He told he, me him, he himself was wounded in the leg at Captain Beer's fight and was not able some time to go but as they carried him and he took oaken leaves and laid them on his wound and through the blessing of god he was able to travel again then i took oaken leaves and laid them upon my side 
and with the blessing of God it cured me also. Yet before the cure was wrought, I may say, as in Psalm 38, 516, my wounds stink and are corrupt. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all day long. I sat much alone with a poor wounded child in my lap, which moaned night and day, having nothing to revive the body or cheer the spirits of her. But instead of that, sometimes the Indian would come and tell me one hour that your master will knock your head, child in the head, and then a second, and then a third. Your na master will quickly knock your child in the head. This was the comfort I had from the miserable comforters, are ye all, as he said. Thus nine days I sat upon my knees with my babe in my lap till my flesh was raw again, my child being ready to depart the sorrowful world. They bade me carry it out to another wigwam, I suppose because they did not to be troubled with such spectacles. Whither I went with a very heavy heart and sat, and down I sat with the picture of death in my lap. About two hours into the night, my sweet babe, like a lamb, departed this life on February 18th. 1675, it being about six years and five months old. It was nine days from the first wounding in this miserable condition without any refreshing of one nature or another except a little cold water. I could not but take notice how at another time I could not bear to be in a room where any dead person was, but now the case has changed. I must and could lie down by my dead babe side by side all night after. I have thought since of the wonderful goodness of God to me in preserving me in the use of my reason and senses in that distressed time, that I did not use wicked and violent means to end my own miserable life. In the morning, when they understood that my child was dead, they sent for me to my master's wigwam, but by my master in this writing must be understood Quinnipin, who was a sagamore and married King Philip's wife's sister. Not that he first took me, but I was sold to him by another Narragansett Indian who took me when first I came from the garrison. I went to take up my dead child in my arms to carry it with me, but they bid me to let it alone. There was no resisting, but go I must and leave it. When I had been at my master's wigwam, I took the opportunity I could to get back to my dead child. When I came, I asked them what they had done with it, and they told me it was upon the hill. Then I went and showed me where it was, where I saw the ground was newly digged, and that they told me they had buried it. There I left that child in the wilderness, and must commit it, and myself also, in this wilderness condition, to him who is above all. God having taken away this dear child, I went to see my daughter Mary, who was at the same time was at this same Indian town at a wigwam not far off, though we had little liberty or opportunity to see one another. She was about ten years old and taken from the door at first by a praying Indian and afterwards sold for a gun. When I came in sight, she would fall a weeping, at which they were provoked and would not let me come near her, but bade me be gone, which was, heart -cutting, which was a heart-cutting word to me. I had one child dead, another in the wilderness, I knew not where. The third they would not let me come near to, me, as it says, have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simon is not, and ye will take Benjamin also. All these things are against me. I could not still sit still in this condition, but kept walking from one place to another. And as I was going along, my heart was even overwhelmed with the thoughts of my condition and that I should have children, and a nation which I knew not ruled over them, whereupon I earnestly entreated the Lord that he would consider my low estate and show me a, to a token for good, and if it were his blessed will, some sign and hope of some relief. And indeed, quickly the Lord answered, in some measure, my poor prayers. For as I was going up and down, mourning and lamenting my condition, my son came to me and asked how I did. I had not seen him before since the destruction of the town, and I knew not where he was till I was informed by himself that he was amongst a smaller parcel of Indians whose place was about six miles off. With tears in his eyes, he asked me whether his sister Sarah was dead and told me that he had seen his sister Mary and prayed for me that I would not be troubled in reference to himself. The occasion of his coming to see me at this time was this. There was, as I said, about six miles from us, a small plantation of Indians where it seemed he had been 
during his captivity, and at this time there were also some forces of the Indians gathered out of our company, and some also from, uh, from them, among whom was his son's master, to go to assault and burn Medfield. In this time of absence of his master, his dame brought him to see me. I took this to be some gracious answer to my earnest and unfeigned desire. The next day, via to this, the Indians returned from Mansfield, all the company, for those that belonged to the other small company came through the town that now we were at. But before they came to us, oh, the outrageous roaring and whooping that there was. They began their din about a mile before they came to us. By their noise and whooping, they signified how many they had destroyed, which was at the time 23. Those that were with us at home were gathered together as soon as they heard the whooping. And every time that the other went over their number, these at home gave a shout that the very earth rang. And thus they continued till those that had been upon the expedition were come up to Sagamore's wigwam. And then, oh, the hideous and insulting and triumphing that there was over some Englishmen's scalps that they had taken, as their manner is, and brought with them. I cannot but take notice of this wonderful mercy of God to me in those afflictions in sending me a Bible. One of the Indians that came from Mansfield fight had bought some plunder, came to me and asked if I would have a Bible he had in one of his baskets. I was glad of it and asked him whether he thought the Indians would let me read. He answered yes. So I took the Bible and in that melancholy time it came to me into my mind to read first the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, which I did, and when I had read it, my dark heart wrought on this manner, that there was no mercy for me, that the blessings were gone, that the curses came into the room, and that I had lost my opportunity, but the Lord helped me still to go on reading till I came to chapter 30, at the seven first verses where I found there was mercy promised again, if we would return to him by repentance." Though they were scattered from one end of the earth to the other, yet the Lord would gather us together and turn all those curses upon our enemies. I do not desire to live to forget this scripture and what comfort it was to me. Now the Indians began to talk of removing from this place, some one way, some the other. And there were now besides myself, nine English captives in this place, all of them children except one woman. I got an opportunity to go and take my leave of them they being to go one way and I another. I asked them whether they were in earnest with God for deliverance. They told me that they did and they were able. And this was some comfort to me that the Lord stirred up children to look to him. The woman, viz. good wife, Joslyn, told me she should never see me again and that she would find it in her heart to run away. I wish her not to run away by any means for we were near 30 miles from an English town and she very big with child and had but one week to reckon and another child in her arms two years old, and bad rivers there were to go over, and we were feeble with our poor and coarse entertainment. But I had the Bible with me, and I pulled it out and asked her whether she would read. We opened the Bible and lighted on Psalm 27, in which Psalm we especially took notice that, Wait upon the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. And now I must part with that little company I had. Here I parted from my daughter Mary, whom I never saw again until I saw her in Dorchester return from capt captivity, and from four little cousins and neighbors, some of which I never saw afterward. The Lord only knows the end of them. Amongst them was also that poor woman before mentioned who came to a sad end. As soon as some of the company told me in my travel, she having much grief upon her spirit about her miserable condition, being so near her time, she would often ask the Indians to let her go home, they not being willing to do that, and yet vexed with the importunity, gathered a great company together about her and stripped her naked, and set her in the midst of them. And when they had sung and danced, her, uh, uh, danced about her in a hellish manner, as long as they pleased, they knocked her on the head and the child in her arms with her. When they had done that, they made a fire and put them both into it and told the other children that were with them if they attempted to go home, they would serve them in like manner. The children said she did not shed one tear, but prayed all the time. But to return to my own journey, we traveled about half a day a little more and came to, desolate, to a desolate place in the wilderness 
where there were no wigwams or inhabitants before he came about the middle of the afternoon to this place cold and wet and snowy and hungry and weary and no refreshing for man but the cold ground to sit upon and our poor indian cheer heart-aching thoughts here i had about my poor children who were scattered up and down among the wild beasts of the forest my head was light and dizzy either though through hunger hard lodging or trouble or altogether my knees feeble my body raw by sitting double night and day that i could not express to man the affliction that lay upon my spirit but the lord helped me at that time to express it to himself i opened my bible to read and the lord brought that precious scripture to me thus saith the lord refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears for thy work shall be rewarded and they shall come again from the land of the enemy jeremiah thirty one sixteen this was a sweet cordial to me when i was ready to faint many and many a time i have sat down and wept sweetly over this scripture at the place we continued about four days at this point i'm going to go to the very end of this um, to finish up um, you can read the stuff that's in the middle if you would would like but i i'm wanting to get to the very end of this um, as it's very long, <laughs> you, you can tell. Okay, so I'm going to start here. I can remember the time when I used to sleep quietly without workings in my thoughts, whole nights together, but now it is other ways with me. When all are fast about me, and no eye open but his who ever waketh, my thoughts are upon things past, upon the awful dispensation of the Lord towards us, upon his wonderful power and might in carrying us through so many difficulties in returning us in safety and suffering none to hurt us i remember in the night season how the other day i was in the midst of thousands of enemies and nothing but death before me it is then hard work to persuade myself that ever i should be satisfied with bread again but now we are fed with the finest of wheat and as i may say with honey out of the rock instead of the husk we have the fatted calf the thoughts of all these things in the particulars of them and of the love and goodness of god towards us make it true of me what david said of himself i watered my couch with my tears psalm 6.6 6. oh the wonderful power of god that my eyes have seen affording matter enough for my thoughts to run in and when others are sleeping mine eyes are weeping i have seen the extreme vanity of this world one hour i have been in health and wealthy wanting nothing but the next hour in sickness and wounds and death having nothing but sorrow and affliction before i knew what affliction meant affliction meant i was ready sometimes to wish for it when i lived in prosperity having the comforts of the world about me my relations by me my heart cheerful and taking little care for anything and yet seeing many whom i preferred before myself under many trials and afflictions, in sickness, weakness, poverty, losses, crosses, and cares of the world, I should be sometimes jealous, lest I should have my own portion in this life. And that scripture would come to my mind, For whom the Lord loveth, he chaseth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Hebrews 12.16 But now I see the Lord had his time to scourge and chasten me. The portion of some is to have their afflictions by drops, now one drop, then another, but dregs of the cup, the wine of astonishment. Like a sweeping rain that leaveth no food, did the Lord prepare to be my portion. Affliction I wanted, and affliction I had full measure, I thought, pressed down and running over. Yet I see, when God calls a person to anything, and though never so many difficulties yet, he is fully able to carry them through and make them see, and say they have been gainers thereby. And I hope I can say in some measure, as David did, it's good for me that I have been afflicted. The Lord hath showed me the vanity of these outward things, that they are the vanity of vanities, vanities and vexation of spirit. And they are but a shadow, a blast, a bubble, and things of no continence, that we may rely on God himself and our whole dependence must be upon him. If I trouble from smaller matters begin to arise in me, I have something at hand to check myself with and say, why am I troubled? It was but the other day that I had had the world. 
I would have given it for my freedom or to have been a servant to a Christian. I have learned to look beyond present and smaller troubles and to be quieted under them. As Moses said, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Exodus 14.13 Finis